take a long, hard look at me. Do I look healthy to you? It might surprise many of you to find out that I have a chronic illness. I was born with a connective tissue disorder called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Essentially, the glue that holds my joints together is defective. So on one hand, I'm very flexible, which is pretty cool. <laughs> but on the other hand, my joints dislocate very easily. And my condition comes with a host of symptoms, including chronic joint pain, easy bruising, and heart problems that make managing my health quite complicated. As you might imagine, I've been to many doctors in my time. I've been blessed with several incredible doctors who have truly taken the time to understand my complex needs and have improved my quality of life. But due to my healthy outward appearance, even medical professionals can doubt my illness at times. I've actually been told that I look too young to be sick, despite the fact that I was born with my condition. I have left many appointments feeling completely invalidated and with more questions than answers. And I've found that this is a common experience amongst people with chronic diseases, which could be anything from arthritis to epilepsy or even more rare diseases like my own. Through my experience interacting with doctors as well as being a pre-med student, I've become interested in learning, learning about the shortfalls of doctor-patient communication. Communication is vital to ensuring that everybody receives proper medical care, and current studies, as well as anecdotes, indicates that it fails us in several areas. But there is hope in addressing this problem. Doctors and patients must work together. Surely there is room for improvement in medical education, but everyone in this room has been or will be a patient at some point, and being prepared as a patient is half the battle. So today, we'll first look at the tangible effects of ineffective doctor-patient communication. Then we'll investigate the cause of this pernicious epidemic. And finally, I will show you how we can solve this problem one person at a time. So what exactly is the problem? Doctor-patient communication can be and often is compromised by biases. I think the best way to explain this is to tell a story. In 2013, my mother became extremely ill. She was having headaches and pain all over her body on a daily basis, and she began to seek help from doctors. She went to 14 different doctors, all in different specialties, desperately searching for answers. One doctor told her that she had too many symptoms. Several doctors blamed her symptoms on various mental illnesses, saying that she was just depressed. One doctor went so far as to comment on her attire, saying that she couldn't possibly be sick because she was wearing work clothes and looked healthy. My mother and I have both been accused of faking symptoms on several occasions by trained medical professionals. On a psychological level, these comments can be discouraging and frustrating to someone who is already suffering an illness. It makes us think, is it really all in my head? Is it even worth trying? After persevering through these comments for over a year, it was revealed that my mother had a brain malformation and needed brain surgery. It wasn't all in her head. Or, <laughs> I guess it was, but not in that way. <laughs> After pers <laughs> for the longest time, my mother and I thought that we were the only ones experiencing this problem and that we just had bad luck with doctors. But feeling misunderstood by doctors is an ever-present reality for people with chronic diseases. I decided to post in a Facebook group for chronically ill people asking for their doctor stories. Nearly every single person reported having their symptoms attributed to mental illness or hysteria before they eventually received a diagnosis. The comments that I saw were shocking from doctors li literally telling patients, it's all in your head, or it can't be that bad, one person with the same condition with me was asked by a doctor, if I can run a mile every day, why can't you? One doctor said, I'm the doctor. I will tell you what's wrong, not the other way around. Many feel that they constantly have to prove to doctors that they are actually sick and end up getting labeled as a defiant patient in the process. According to the American Autoimmune Related Diseases Association, 45% of patients are labeled as chronic complainers in the early stages of their illness. The tangible effects of these comments are detrimental. 
blowing off a patient's symptoms like this can lead to a delay in diagnosis. On average, it takes over three years to diagnose an autoimmune disease. An illness with an even poorer track record is endometriosis. Endometriosis is a painful syndrome of the reproductive system that affects one in 10 women in the United States. Despite being relatively common, it takes on average over nine years for a woman to receive a diagnosis. This delay in diagnosis can lead to delay in treatment that can prevent the progression of disease. In a multi-country study published in Health Affairs, the U.S. led the way with over 40% of chronically ill patients reporting that they had had their time wasted at a doctor's appointment or that their doctor's recommendation had little or no value. I can certainly relate to this. When I was 12 years old, I traveled to a specialist far away from home to address my chronic hip pain. After examining me for under five minutes, the doctor informed me that I would have this pain for the rest of my life and that there was absolutely nothing I could do about it. Not only was this untrue, as I sought a second opinion and was able to resolve my pain in under a year, but it was incredibly unhelpful and honestly quite cold, which leads me into the next effect of this issue. Many chronically ill people speak of being traumatized by the experiences they've had with doctors. It's exhausting to constantly have to prove you're sick to someone. Many of us experience chronic fatigue and going through the effort to schedule an appointment and then travel that, to that appointment only to be told that we complain too much makes us want to throw in the towel. And for this reason, many, many chronically ill people do not seek help from doctors again when they need it. While the stigmas facing chronically ill people often go unnoticed, other groups face stigmas as well, and the medical community is starting to take notice. If you're a woman, your pain is much more likely to be attributed to mental illness than if you are a man. You are seven times more likely to be misdiagnosed and sent home from the hospital mid-heart attack because your symptoms may be attributed to anxiety. If you're a person of color, you're less likely to receive effective and vigorous care for diseases from heart disease to cancer. You are less likely to receive strong pain medications than your white counterparts because your pain isn't taken seriously. If you are overweight, it's likely that every symptom you have will be attributed to your weight, even if that isn't truly the cause. In a survey of medical students, it was found that 67% of them endorsed an explicit weight bias. Almost everyone is at risk of having misconceptions get in the way of their medical care and ultimately their health. It's time that we recognize that this is unacceptable and we can do much better. So what exactly is the cause of this issue? An easy answer would be that doctors, like everyone, have internal biases. I think we tend to hold doctors up on a pedestal and assume that they are immune to making unfair judgments. And while this would be ideal, it's simply not the reality. We must acknowledge that doctors are people. However, there are deeper systemic issues at the root of this problem. Through my research, the problem seems to all come back to a lack of connection with patients. A lot of the research on this topic refers to this connection as empathy. But more accurately, the importance lies in the ability of a doctor to identify a patient's emotion and express an understanding. Physician empathy is shown to decrease throughout training. And this makes sense. Medical students are exposed and desensitized to pain and illness. And it would simply be too emotionally taxing for a doctor to invest their emotions into every appointment. For this reason, medical education tends to emphasize the importance of emotional detachment. But it seems that this detachment has gone too far. Doctors are told to focus on the science and avoid interpersonal engagement. The increased reliance on computers in the medical field has further contributed to this problem as doctors turn towards their screens and away from their patients. Another contributing factor is that connecting with patients is emotional labor and requires energy. It's a well-known fact that medical school is difficult and often exhausting, and many physicians experience burnout. Doctors have a lot on their plates. Many see patients every 10 minutes and have intensive documentation requirements that leave little to no time for self-care. It's easy to see why doctors simply don't have the time or energy to connect with their patients. And the effects are dangerous. When doctors don't understand what their patients are going through, 
patient satisfaction is shown to decrease, less accurate diagnoses are made, and health outcomes are shown to worsen. So if connecting with patients truly is so vital to improving health outcomes for patients of all types, how can we shift the focus? First and foremost, doctors need to be receiving training on this during medical school. Currently, not very many medical schools train doctors in these issues, but teaching doctors to look past biases is a skill that needs to be taught. One company in the US is already starting to give tra training like this to doctors. The training focuses on teaching doctors to use their sensory skills to identify a patient's emotions and then take the patient's perspective in order to understand their experience. The preliminary results are promising. In one study, after doctors received only three hours of this training, their empathy scores were shown to significantly improve along with patient satisfaction. So while I think this training truly is the solution to the problem, a change like this is going to take time. What can you do right now to ensure that you're receiving the best care possible as a patient? First, I recommend bringing a list of questions that you have for your doctor to every appointment. This ensures that every question you have will be answered and it makes the appointment much more efficient. Second, if you're unsatisfied with the care you're receiving from a doctor, let them know. A doctor's appointment should be viewed as any other service. If you went to a restaurant and they brought you the wrong meal, you would complain. It should be the exact same with a doctor's appointment. If a doctor isn't helping you in the way that you need or is using jargon and speaking over your head, you must tell them. And if the care does not improve, it's time for a second opinion. Third and finally, you must be fully honest with your doctor. Trust is a two-way street, and the doctor must know the full story in order to properly treat your condition. I truly hope that no one in this room will ever experience a doctor doubting their pain, but I've yet to meet a chronically ill person who doesn't have a story like my own. Doctor-patient communication is struggling, but there is hope, and we have the power to change that. We must ensure that the next generation of doctors is aware of the importance of connecting with patients. The power is in our hands to improve the medical practice for the better. Thank you.